Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our study of the book of Leviticus, the book of holiness. I'm John Walker, and along with others, I'm sitting with Bruce Watsick, the minister of the Princeton Church of Christ. Bruce, where are we in our study of Leviticus? Well, John, we're in the second half of the book. Uh, uh, starting in chapter 18, you've got a whole new section of the book of Leviticus, and uh, many scholars refer to this last section of the book as the holiness code because it gets down and defines uh, what it means to be holy. Uh, and as we saw in our previous studies in here, it encompasses every dimension of life. Uh, but something that you know, jumps out to you uh, is how sexual ethics are very important uh, in the biblical teaching. And that's very different uh, from the pagan religions that, that almost worship uh, sexuality. And so it's a, a very different take. But holiness had to do with every dimension of your life, how you treated your neighbor, uh, whether you took care of the poor. Uh, every dimension of life was encompassed with things that either made you holy or made you unclean. Then last week, we saw special instructions for the priest about who they could marry, who they could not marry, uh, about even close relatives that they could touch who had died and not touched, and different rules for the high priest and for the other priests, uh, and then other moral exhortations to remain clean and not to seek to uh, be a participant in the worship and be in an unclean state, or else one was to be cut off from their people. And so that leads us to chapter 23, and uh, that's where we want to pick up tonight, that part of the verse one. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, these are the appointed feasts of the Lord that you shall proclaim as holy con convocations. They are my appointed feasts. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work. It is a Sabbath to the Lord in all your dwelling places. Bruce, why does he start with uh, the Sabbath as the, uh, and discussing the appointed feasts? Well, it's kind of interesting. Uh, as far as we know from any research throughout uh, uh, any ancient societies, the Jews were the first people to identify the basic unit of time uh, as a seven-day week. That goes back to the creation account in Genesis uh, chapter 1. Uh, and uh, therefore, they set aside one day of the week, the seventh day of the week, our Saturday, as a Sabbath day. And this was different also than other people. Uh, you find most other ancient nations might have a, a lunar calendar, like once a, a month they would have a special a religious holiday or some special occasion. But for the Jews, their timetable was about seven. And we're going to see when they have some of their uh, uh, special uh, holidays and holy days, you know, holidays short for holy days, actually, they would worship for seven days, those seven of such an integral part of everything. And then in the seventh month uh, was a special a month for them. So seven was very profound. But in looking back to the rationale, why did God choose the Sabbath day for them to rest? Uh, there are two reasons given in scripture. Uh, one of them is uh, creational related to the creation of the earth. And that's found in Exodus 20, uh, verse 11. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So he's saying the reason why the Jews are to keep the Sabbath day as a holy day is the example of God himself in the creation narrative in Genesis 1 and into the first part of chapter 2. 
when after finishing the restoration of creation in the first six days, it said God rested on the seventh day. And so based on the creation, they are to follow God's example and also have a day of rest. And again, you know, we're, we're so used to having two days of rest, so to speak, five day, eight hour work day. But back in their day, it was not unusual for people to work seven days a week, 12 and, and 16 hours worth of work, uh, depending on how much sunlight they had. And so it was a novel thing for a people to take off, if you will, once a week and to have a day where they remember God and remember who is their creator and remember that they are to be image bearers of him. But then there's a salvation reason also given for keeping the Sabbath. This is found in Deuteronomy 5, verse 15. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day holy. So the very day on which God brought them out was the Sabbath day, uh, the day of deliverance, if you will, the day when they were no longer slaves of Egypt and were a free people uh, came about on a Sabbath day. So when they rested on the Sabbath day, not only did they remember God and his creative activity and rest on the seventh day, but they also remembered if it had not been for God's divine action to save them, they would still be slaves of the Egyptians, but that God had acted and set them free. And so each uh, seventh day, they remembered also how they had been delivered and how they now were free people, uh, God's people, God's covenant people because of God's divine uh, initiative in the Exodus. So those are the two types of reasons why uh, they were to make the seventh day a week a special day. Now, it's interesting in the New Testament, we find examples of the early Christians meeting on the first day of the week. We're never given uh, an exact explanation of that, but using the logic of the Sabbath day, why would you change it? Well, it's because Jesus was raised on the first day of the week. Jesus is a part of the new creation. So eighth day or first day, a new creation. So there's a creational reason. We're a part of the new creation. And secondly, salvation. We are saved by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Jesus' tragic death would have been a tragic death, but if not for his resurrection, there would be no salvation. Uh, there would be no hope of life beyond death. And so we are saved by God's divine initiative in Jesus most especially the resurrection of Jesus on the first day of the week. And so that, you know, the Sabbath kind of is a backdrop of explanation of why they met. And you can infer from uh, it that there must be a creational as well as a salvation reason why the early church would change uh, to our first day of the week or our Sunday. Let's continue on and back in chapter. 23, uh, verse 4. These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, <clears throat> the holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at the time appointed for them. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not do any work, any ordinary work, but you shall present a food offering to the Lord for seven days. On the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. Who is how is the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread connected? Now, oftentimes, uh, we are very familiar with the Passover because it was at the Passover festival that Jesus became our Passover lamb. He became the lamb sacrificed 
to God as the lamb was sacrificed at the Passover. Now, of course, the Passover itself was a remembrance of the fact that God had taken the initiative to deliver them from Egyptian slavery. They had slaughtered the lamb, put the blood across the doorpost, and the death angel, when he came, if they had the blood of the lamb on the doors, passed over them, thus Passover. But for the Egyptians or any unbelieving Israelites who did not do that, their firstborn were killed. The last of the 10 plagues that finally forced Pharaoh reluctantly to let these slave people go. Of course, he changed his mind later, chased them into uh, destruction. But uh, he was forced to set them free. And then they, they had to leave very quickly. And so the idea of unleavened bread is the fact they didn't have time to leaven their bread. Uh, they had to eat the bread of affliction. They had to eat, you know, the less tasty type of bread because they had to hastily exodus from Egypt. Why? Because Pharaoh was going to change his mind. If they didn't get out of town and get some distance away, Pharaoh would have captured them again and brought them back. And so the unleavened bread was to remember they had to make a quick exodus, that God set them free, but they had to take initiative. So the Passover remembered that special night before the exodus and the Passover lamb sacrifice and the blood of the lamb being the basis of their not experiencing death. Uh, but the unleavened bread uh, was a seven-day festival that followed immediately after the Passover. Uh, and the first day and the seventh day, there was a special holy convocation where there was to be no work on those days. Now, when you also look at it from an uh, ancient perspective, the idea of leaven was the idea of influence. And oftentimes, the idea of leavening had a negative influence. It was the idea of that uh, your batch of bread was being corrupted. Uh, that if it leavened enough, it would deteriorate completely. And so sin and wickedness became associated with leaven and its influence. And unleavened was synonymous with being pure and clean. And so as a result of that, this once a year when they celebrated the Passover, they immediately leading up to it, they got rid of all the yeast in their houses. And they started over the fresh lump of uh, bread, unleavened. And for that first week, that's the only kind of bread that they ate. And that's why at the Lord's Supper, which was instituted uh, at the Passover, uh, they ate unleavened bread because it was the unleavened uh, season. Secondly, that's why we drink grape juice rather than wine, because it was also unleavened wine, which was grape juice before it had Permanent. And so as a result of that, we see the influence of unleavenedness on even what we do today uh, when we participate in the Lord's Supper, which had its origins with Jesus at this Passover season, talking to his disciples, saying, I've got a new covenant, and it's going to be about my body and my blood, and that you're going to remember me. And so on the first day of the week, we find uh, disciples coming together and taking the Lord's Supper. It was the Lord's day, the day of the resurrection. They remembered Christ's sacrifice, and they remembered it not as an isolated incident, but on the day of resurrection. So therefore, it's sad that Christ had to die for us, but we're full of joy because God raised him from the dead, and we have the hope of forgiveness and uh, eternal life. But leaven and Passover were intimately connected, so much so that we find Paul alluding to it in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, uh, verses 6 through 8. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are in leaven. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, 
not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So we see that Paul is drawing a profound lesson from the Passover and his connection uh, with the unleavened festival of seven days. And here he says, you know, we need to get rid of the old leaven. What was the old leaven? Well, that's the way the Corinthians used to be before they came to Christ. Now our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. We've been set free uh, from our sinful, selfish pattern of our past life. Uh, so uh, therefore, let us celebrate the Passover, not the old leaven, but malice and evil, which they had all participated in, but instead with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And so in Christ, we are experiencing the unleavenedness of a new life, of a cleansed life, of a pure life, a new life as new creations in Christ. And so Paul draws that uh, example out of the Passover and unleavened bread festival to remind them that we are participating in our own form of that in our Christ salvation and our new life uh, in him. So that's uh, an interesting connection that Paul saw, of course, knowing uh, the festivals of the Jews. But of course, the scripture of the early church was the Old Testament, and they would be familiar with it as well. And let's uh, return to our text and pick up with the next uh, uh, festival, verse 9. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land that I give you and reap its harvest, you shall bring the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priests. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord so that you may be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And on the day when you wave the sheaf, you shall offer a male lamb a year old without blemish or without blemish as a burnt offering to the Lord. And the grain offering with it shall be two tenths of an ephah, a fine flour mixed with oil, a food offering to the Lord with a pleasing aroma. And the drink offering with it shall be of wine, a fourth of, of a hen. And you shall eat neither bread nor grain, parched or fresh until this same day, until you have brought the offering of your God. It is a statue forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. Bruce, what is the significance of the Feast of First Fruits? Interesting. Uh, the First Fruits Festival was immediately on the heels of the Passover, the unleavened bread, because this was the season when the very first part of the harvest began to ripen. And again, what we have to keep in mind uh, as we look at these festivals of the Jews. These were their holidays or holy days throughout the year, but they were all intimately connected with the agricultural calendar of their day. Well, why would that be? Because 95% of the Jews in the ancient times would have been totally involved in agriculture, either raising animals or out tilling the fields or harvesting them or a combination of both. And so their lives were organized around the flow of agriculture. Now, the agriculture, of course, is dependent upon rain. And therefore, uh, what you see is their seasons organized around it. First of all, uh, it begins to rain, uh, usually, uh, say, in late October and November. They get some rain. They call it the early rains. It'll rain a little bit then and then stop a little bit. And then they get the real rainy season by December, uh, January, February, March, April. Um, and then it kind of dries up and then they have a kind of drought throughout the summer, about three months and into September. Um, and so these first three episodes, the Passover, the unleavened bread, and the first fruits 
were right at the beginning after the, as the rainy season was coming to an end, and the very first crop would usually be a barley crop. And so it'd be a sheave would be taken away before the Lord. So they were anticipating, first fruits, a big harvest. There was no guarantee of that, but they were trusting in God. God had provided the rain thus far. Hopefully he would allow them to gather in the harvest over the next month or so. First the, the barley harvest and then the wheat harvest. And then over the summer, when there'd be a kind of a drought, was a period when they would uh, have the grapes harvested, uh, have the figs harvested. And by the fall, early fall would be knocking down the olives and collecting them, pressing them in uh, to olive oil to be used. And so these were the major things that they grew and they grew around the cycle. And then just as they were finishing the olive harvest and thus the last of their harvesting uh, in the fall would come the seventh month. And then we have three festivals in a row there. Uh, and that anticipated, hopefully, rain would come again, the early rains and the later rains, so that their crops would be plentiful. So if we think about first fruits, it's first fruits. that the very first sign of a harvest, just the very first shoots. The whole harvest has a barley hasn't come in, just a few shoots. And they bring it in anticipating a great harvest because the land is a gift from God and they're uh, being bountiful in their enjoyment of uh, a successful harvest, all dependent upon the Lord. Now, what is interesting is uh, in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 26, verse 1 through 11, we actually have a prescribed confessional that uh, the Jews were to engage in uh, at the first fruits giving. It's worthwhile reading it, verses 1 through 11 of Deuteronomy 26. Sorry for the delay. Deuteronomy uh, 26. 26. When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving, you for an inheritance and have taken possession of it and live in it, you shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground, which you harvest from your land that the Lord your God is giving you. And you shall put it in a basket and you shall go to the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name to dwell there. And you shall go to the priest who is in the office at the time and say to him, I declare today to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our fathers to give us. Then the priest shall take the basket from your hand and set it down before the altar of the Lord your God. And you should, if you shall respond, <clears throat> and you shall make response before the Lord your God, a wandering or a man was my father. And he went down into Egypt and sojourned there, few in number, and there he became a nation, great, mighty, and populous. And the Egyptians treated us harshly and humiliated us and laid on us hard labor. Then we cried to the Lord, the God of our fathers. And the Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm with great deeds of terror, with signs and wonders. And he brought us into the place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And behold, now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground, which you, O Lord, have given me. And you shall set it down before the Lord your God and worship before the Lord your God. And you shall rejoice in all the good that the Lord your God has given to you and to your house, you and the Levite and the sojourner who is among you. Now, so they were to confess the reality of their history. Uh, we used to just be wandering Aramean uh, like Abraham and the other patriarch. We didn't have a permanent home. We didn't have a place to settle down. We didn't have agriculture in the way we have it now. We had herds, but we had to take them places where no one else wanted to go. But then it got worse for us. We ended up going down to Egypt, seeking refuge there, 
and we were treated badly and enslaved by them. But God saw our need and he delivered us with mighty signs. And so now this is the land you've given us. So I, even though I myself have been to Egypt and I myself was not a wandering Aramean in my lifetime, we're now a settled community living in the land God has given us. I will never forget that this land is a gift from God and that without God's divine intervention, we would be no people at all, or we would be a slave people. But God acted, and therefore he made true his promise to Abraham and his covenant uh, with Moses, and we are the covenant people of God. And so we bring the first fruits. Uh, we, don't, we don't hold on to first fruits saying, well, we don't want to give any of that up because who knows how much the harvest will come. No, we give freely the very best and the first fruits to God in anticipation of his rich blessings throughout the rest of the harvest. So the first fruits are just the beginning of what God is going to do to bless his people. Now in the New Testament, uh, first fruits is an important concept. Let's notice what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verse uh, 26. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man, <clears throat> by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own, his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. So he's looking at the resurrection of Jesus, and he's saying, this is just the beginning. God raised Jesus from the dead as evidence of first fruits. What fruit? The fruit of a resurrection hope. His promise is he's going to raise everyone from the dead to face the judgment, some to contempt and to the loss of eternal life, others to everlasting life. Uh, in God. And so uh, the resurrection itself is a kind of first fruits, a beginning, a, a foretaste of what God's rich bounty is going to be, which is the resurrection hope that he's promised us in Christ. Now, what's interesting uh, is, of course, taking this idea of first fruits, um, remember the day that Jesus was uh, raised from the dead was on the uh, first day of the week. Let's look, let's look at Mark uh, 16, uh, verse 2. Wow. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone from for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where, the, where they laid him. Now, so the important point here is that Jesus was raised when? On the first day of the week. So he was in the tomb that long, a part of one day, very short part of this day, and all of the Sabbath day. And so God raised him from the dead, gave him a new body, transformed his old body where there was an empty tomb. And all that is evidence to us of the hope that we have. Like I said, we're first fruits too. We're beginning to experience the blessings of God. And that is the resurrection hope. That's why the resurrection is so important. That's why we meet on the first day of the week, not some other day of the week. It is the resurrection day. We are a new creation. We are participating in the first fruits of a whole new life that awaits us at the resurrection of the dead. And then returning to Leviticus uh, 23, let's look at the next uh, Verse 15. 
You shall count seven full weeks from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering. You shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall present a grain offering of new grain to the Lord. You shall bring from your dwelling places two loaves of bread to be weighed, made of two tenths of an ephah. They shall be a fine flour, and they shall be baked with leaven as first fruits to the Lord. And you shall present with the bread seven lambs as a year old without blemish, and one bull from the herd and two rams. They shall be a burnt offering to the Lord with their grain offering and their drink offerings, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And you shall offer one male goat for a sin offering and two male lambs, a year old, as a sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits as a wave offering before the Lord with the two lambs. They shall be holy to the Lord for the priests. And you shall make a proclamation on the same day you shall hold a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. It is a statute forever in, in all your dwelling places throughout your generations. And when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge, nor shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord, your God. Bruce, why is a feast of weeks later called Pentecost? Well, uh, of course, the Jews originally spoke Hebrew, but by the first century, Hebrew was no longer a living language. Even the Jews did not speak it to one another on a daily basis. They spoke a variant related language called Aramaic. Uh, but the language of the civilization in general, the Roman Empire, was the Greek language. And in Greek, the Greek uh, word Pentecost means 50. And what did he say here? You're to go out, Sabbaths, seven Sabbaths and a day. So 49 plus 1, 50. So that's why they call it Pentecost, because it's a 50-day wait. And notice the difference is there's also a kind of first fruits here. By this time, you're involved in the wheat harvest. And this time, it's not unleavened, but leavened bread and a variety of sacrifices that you are to participate in. And all of this is celebrating the fact that God has blessed you. The barley harvest, the wheat harvest have come in. You're going to have uh, the grain to provide enough food for your family and perhaps excess to might sell to others uh, for the coming year. Uh, the rains came, they stopped at an appropriate time. You're able to harvest a crop. I mean, you know, you know, we're so used to driving to a grocery store to pick up our food. You know, we just almost forget that some one to 2% of our population are involved in agriculture. And if suddenly, you know, the rains didn't come, there's a drought, or if they didn't successfully get the crops out of the field, we could have severe uh, food shortages. And it, it still depends on the weather. As Americans, we can still buy produce from other parts of the world, but uh, we still depend upon the weather and we depend upon those who harvest the crop. But for them, their entire life depend on where these crops came in, whether they are able to harvest them. If they didn't, you know, maybe that somebody, uh, maybe the king stored a little grain and maybe that dole out a little bit, but you couldn't go long without having a successful harvest. So this is the end of the uh, grain harvest season. And when, by June, about June when this will occur, and then the dry season ensued after this. And so they were to celebrate and rejoice. And notice he's, he reminded them, you know, you don't just rejoice and think about yourself, but he said, don't reap the harvest of your land, uh, your field right up to the edge, as something he said earlier. You shall gather, not gather the gleanings, it's leftover. You shall leave them for who? For the poor or sojourn, somebody that's not a native to the land who has no family there. So, God was always 
thinking about how he could bless his people and how if those among them ended up poor, lost their land, you know, by death of the family or some means, how the people of God could take care of those people as well, not just take care of themselves, but think of others as well. And so God made provision for even those who had no land, who didn't have a job uh, that they could even work at, perhaps. And uh, God wanted them to be taken care of, too. And so this is all about uh, bountiful harvest, praising God, acknowledging God as the giver of the land, and the continual blessing of the land with bountiful crops. And uh, that's what this festival was all about. And of course, we remember Pentecost because that was the day of which the Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples and apostles of Jesus and filled them with the Holy Spirit. Let's look at Acts 2, verse 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were, where they were sitting. And divided tongues as, <clears throat> as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So here we find a reversal of the Tower of Babel, where languages were confused. Now God is giving the gift of language so the gospel can be preached uh, in every language. And they had people gathered at Pentecost from all over the world. And the apostles were able, by the inspiration of the Spirit uh, that came down and filled them, to be able to speak the gospel uh, to all the nations. So this is the first day after the resurrection, crucifixion, resurrection of Jesus that the gospel was preached and people were told to repent and be baptized. So if you will, a first fruits was uh, beginning to be gathered in besides the core of disciples that Jesus reached and trained uh, during his earthly ministry. We realize thousands were baptized on that day, a great Jewish festival celebrating the bounty of God. Well, the fruitfulness of the gospel was also going to be celebrated. And it was rightful that it began on a day when they celebrated God's rich blessings because what greater gift can God give than the indwelling spirit of God that uh, fills our lives, empowers us, enables us to live fruitful, godly lives and to be able to share the gospel uh, with others as well. And so, Pentecost, a great Jewish festival that has taken on new significance for us because it was the day in which God chose uh, to send the Holy Spirit uh, to live within his new couple of people, uh, the Church of Jesus Christ. Let's continue on. Let's pick up uh, back in Leviticus 23, verse uh, 23. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, In the seventh month of the first day of the month, you shall observe a day of solemn rest, a memorial proclaimed with a blast of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary, any ordinary work, and you shall present a food offering to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Now on the tenth day of this seventh month is the day of atonement. It shall be for you a time of holy convocation, and you shall afflict yourselves and present a food offering to the Lord. And you shall not do any work on that very day, for it is a day of atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whoever is not afflicted on that very day shall be cut off from his people. And whoever does any work on that very day, that person I will destroy from among his people and you shall not do any work. It is a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwelling places. It shall be to, to you a Sabbath of solemn rest and you shall afflict yourselves. 
On the ninth day of the month, beginning at evening, from evening to evening, shall you keep your Sabbath. Bruce, why in the seventh month do they celebrate three festivals? Uh, again, I think the symbolism of seven was very potent. Seven day week, seven days for uh, many of the festivals. Uh, seven sevens and then a day uh, time in between uh, before we had uh, the Pentecost day. So seven was an integral part of their understanding of things. Now, what's interesting is, as we can tell, they originally, the first, thus the new year, began on the first month, which would be back in March and April, back at the time of the Passover. But later on, the Jews began to celebrate the new year uh, at the beginning of the seventh month. We don't know exactly when this transition took place, but we know it did take place. And so therefore the blowing of the trumpets this solemn day was seen as the beginning of a new year. Now we've talked extensively about the day of atonement. And so I don't wanna just repeat that. I mean, that's a profound uh, event. It's the only place as we noted that the Old Testament scriptures promises forgiveness for anything other than unintentional sin. But it promises for wickedness and rebellion can be forgiven on the day of atonement. If the people confess their sin, they afflict themselves, they are repentant and turning to God seeking uh, his favor. But the month began with a trumpet call with the shofar, the ram's a trumpet blown this would be blown to warn of impending attack or as you were going to attack. It was a warning uh, of something important to come. The seventh month had begun. Uh, they were entering the season where they'd gone through in the seventh month, they'd gone through a period of drought, no rain. And they were hoping for the early rains to come so that they could plant their crops and see another uh, a successful battlefield. Our, but with the idea of the trumpet call, it picked up significance in the idea of the return of Christ. So here we have the return at the end of the season. Uh, God is calling people their new year, a new beginning. Uh, let's look at 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18, and see, of course, how the trumpet call under the new covenant takes on a special significance. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, I encourage one, therefore encourage one another with these words. So he's talking about the return of Christ. And it's at the return of Christ that uh, those the dead in Christ will rise first. Those who are still alive on the earth will join them uh, meeting the Lord uh, in the air. Uh, and therefore, we have this resurrection promise and resurrection hope. Therefore, we should encourage one another. So the trumpet call of God is associated with both the judgment the judgment day is to follow, but it's also an announcement of a new era. This is the new heaven and the new earth, the new Jerusalem, the new age of God uh, will ensue uh, based on this trumpet call. And so we see how that ties back into the role in later Judaism that uh, this uh, trumpet call day and convocation beginning a new year the symbolism that that happened. Um, let's look at the last section here, verse 33 and following, and wrap up our series of the festivals. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel saying on the first, on the 15th day of this seventh month and for seven days is the feast of booths to the Lord. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. 
for seven days you shall present food offerings to the Lord. On the eighth day, you shall hold a holy convocation and present a food offering to the Lord. It is a solemn assembly. You shall not do any ordinary work. These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim as, as times of holy convocation for presenting to the Lord food offerings, burnt offerings and grain offerings, sacrifices and drink offerings, each on its proper day besides the Lord's Sabbaths and besides your gifts and besides all your vow offerings and besides all your free will offerings, which you, shall, which, which you give to the Lord. On the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the, pro, in the produce of the land, you shall celebrate the feast of the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a solemn rest and on the eighth day shall be a solemn rest. And you shall take on this first day the fruit of splendid trees, branches of palm trees and bowls of leafy trees and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. You shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It is a statue forever throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in the booths for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Thus Moses declared to the people of Israel the appointed feast of the Lord. Bruce, what did the celebration of the feast of booths remind the people of Israel? So here at the end of the harvest, after they get the last, which used to be the olives, maybe even at that time to press the olives by this time, by the 15th day of the seventh month, uh, what were they looking forward to? Well, they had all the harvest had come in. They were celebrating the bounty of the harvest God had blessed them with. They were beyond the initial stage at the final stage. And now they were ready to plant uh, new crops for a new year. Uh, but first they wanted to celebrate and rejoice for seven days. Uh, and he said, I want you to live. Now he's anticipating they're going to be living in settled homes, but now I want you to get out of your home, set up a tent, a booth, however you want to call it, and I want you to live in that seven days. Well, why? To remember that Israel used to live in tents, the patriarchs did. And then for the wilderness wandering, after I delivered them initially from Egyptian slavery, they wandered 40 years in the wilderness living in booths. Now, you don't have to live permanently in booths anymore because I've given you the land of Canaan. And this land is a land full of milk and honey, full of rich blessing. And you are now experiencing the end of that harvest season. And you should rejoice in the Lord and be thankful for all the ways. He has blessed you by bringing offerings to him and celebrating with all the other people uh, of Israel. So that's the, the backdrop of this festival of booths. But there's an interesting uh, passage uh, in the book of uh, Zechariah, uh, Zechariah 14, verse 16 through 19. And everyone who survives. Of, the, of all the nations that have come against Jerusalem shall go up year after year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of booths. And if any of the families of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. And if the family of Egypt does not go up and present themselves, then on them there shall be no rain. There shall be the plague which with which the Lord afflicts the nations that do not go up to keep the Feast of Booths. No, it's interesting. This is focused on the Festival of Booths. Zechariah is looking to a day when all the nations will come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Festival of Booths. Uh, and if they don't, uh, God will withhold rain from them and send on them plagues. So, in the future, I don't think he's literally talking about going to Jerusalem and celebrating the booth. He's talking about all the nations coming uh, to worship the one true God who at that time uh, centers his worship at the temple 
uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, but it's, it's interesting, he selects the festival of booze and he associates it with, if you don't celebrate it, you won't have any rain. Well, think about it. They've just gone through a season every year before the festival of booze when literally there's no rain for three months, sometimes longer. Uh, and they're hoping for the early rain to occur shortly after the Festival of Booze. But they don't know for sure that it will occur. And so in Jesus' day, uh, one of the things they did, the high priest would go to, to the Pool of Siloam and get a golden uh, thing of water and would march through the city and people would cheer and chant. And he'd go up to the altar of God and pour out the water. The symbolism was uh, we believe because we worship our God, he'll bring the rains. He'll bring an abundance upon us that will be, again, the rains were the way that they grew their crops and the way they were able to quench their thirst. Everything depended on water. And so this festival, at the very end of their season, anticipated the coming of rains and of water. And so with that in mind, we covered this already in our Gospel of John, but it might be worthwhile just to look at this and to close. Uh, Gospel of John, chapter 7, uh, verses 2 and 3, and then later, uh, verse 37 and 39, the same chapter. Now the Jews' the feast of booths was at hand. So his brothers said to him, Leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. And of course, this was the occasion where they were chiding him, why are you hanging out in Galilee? If you're such a great prophet doing such wonders, you know, why are you keeping it off in Galilee? Why don't you have the courage to go up to Jerusalem and show them your power? And again, they, they didn't quite understand who Jesus was at this. His own family didn't. And Jesus appeared to decline, I, I'm not going up with you. But he did come up quietly to the festival booth later. Uh, and that's what we pick up later and read what he had to say in uh, verse 37 to 39, same chapter. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So Jesus says, if anyone thirsts, so think at the festival booth, they've gone through a drought for three to four months, and they're hoping for rain. If it doesn't rain, the water won't collect. They won't be able to have drinking water. Uh, they won't have water to soften the soil for their original sowing of the soil. Uh, they won't have water and rain uh, to nourish their crops so that they come in plentiful. That's what they're anticipating. And so Jesus said, uh, if you're thirsty, come to me. You know, don't, don't look to the rains and say, come to me. Uh, or as the scripture, out of your heart will flow rivers of living water, probably an allusion to another reference in Zechariah, where he talks about water coming out of the temple of Jerusalem, God creating a fountain that flowed out of living water. Um, and what is this living water that Jesus is promised? Something that will really quench our spiritual thirst. It's the Holy Spirit of God. You know, God did give his Holy Spirit to be an indwelling presence under the old covenant. And until Jesus' death and resurrection, the Spirit could not be sent. And now, as we read earlier on the day of Pentecost, God sent his Spirit. And now all those that repent are baptized into Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sin and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes we don't value that enough to realize it's the presence of the Spirit that marks us as God's children. It's the empowering of the Spirit that enables us to live Christ-like and godly lives. It's the presence of the Spirit that directs us to preach the good news and to 
get the message out. And so we have this great gift here at the end of the age. Uh, now we have the presence of God, not in a temple in Jerusalem, but in our bodies. We have the very presence of God living in us and living through us. What a powerful message that Jesus was challenging them to quench their spiritual thirst in a way that God would fully satisfy all their spiritual needs. So through Christ and the giving of his spirit, we not only are forgiven of sin, but we're empowered to live as new creations in Jesus Christ. Praise be to God for his wonderful gift of life through his son, Jesus, and the end of all experience. God, would you lead us in a word of prayer and close? Father, we are humble, Lord, that through Christ we can call you God, Father, and that you regard us as your children, sealed by your Holy Spirit. We thank you for uh, the membership in your forever family, to be recognized by you, to be kin to one another on this time side of life in preparation of spending eternity together. Father, we Pray that we truly allow your Holy Spirit to dwell in us richly uh, by our study and praise and worship and fellowship, our total devotion to you. Lord, we ask uh, special prayers upon this night and this study that you bless the hearts who are in attendance, both live and the recorded version, that we are encouraged and we are equipped to go forward to show uh, a reason why we have a hope in your dear son. Father, we thank you for uh, the blessing of prayer that we can lift up those who are in need. We thank you for our dear sister Becky, uh, truly a hard fighting soldier uh, in your army. And Lord, we know that as she uh, bravely and courageously undergoes her her health journey. Father, we know that we are able to encourage her and lift her up. Let her know that we are here, Father, as you are here for us. Father, we thank you for our sister Sharon, uh, who is also uh, on her journey with uh, health conditions, be with our sister Joyce, Trotman, Father, and Lord, for all of those who we don't lift up by name, bless them as only you can, comfort them as only you can, and Father, heal them as only you can. We thank you for Bruce, our teacher, uh, and our pastor uh, here at the Princeton Church of Christ, that uh, through his guidance, we can live a more righteous life through the education and example that he set as he follows your son, Jesus. And Father, for all who are in attendance, bless us, keep us, and guide us. For it is in Jesus' name this prayer is asked. Amen.